when the IPCC entered or issued its second, or its, I think it's the fourth report, uh, the hockey stick wasn't even mentioned. It was just like it never existed in the first place. Really? And this is what they do a lot with the the failed attempts to prove that man is causing global warming when mm. they finally found out that the data was erroneous or was used incorrectly or whatever. <laughs> yeah. They just ignore it. They don't try to admit that they've ever met it, made a mistake. <laughs> Oh my God! Okay, yeah. So they just omit that part and then you know moves on, move on to the next piece of evidence, so to speak. Correct. Hmm. So I mean, what about this thing with the let's let's talk about the ice core samples uh, um, again in your film? Uh, you pointed out that the the CO2 levels and and uh, in regards to the ice core samples that uh, and this was pretty interesting that when when we when you did the overlay of these two, um, we we could see that. Uh, I guess that CO2 actually uh, drives the, uh, or, or the other way around, I should say, the, yeah. the, that the warm, uh, the temperature actually drives CO2 levels. Talk about that a little bit. Well, this is, I think, one of the most classic deceptive tools that have been used by the IPCC, and, and Al Gore used it in his film, The Inconvenient Truth, uh, where you have, you, they can actually track CO2 levels back to 450 to 650,000 years ago through taking these ice cores. And they can also determine what the relative temperatures were during that period of time. And again, none of these are exactly accurate. You cannot possibly get exact. This isn't an exact portrayal of exactly what happened back there, but it is mm-hmm. a very accurate trend. I mean, it is very good from that particular perspective. Mm-hmm. And what Al Gore and the IPCC do is they split those two curves and then we put one over the top of the other. They show that CO2 goes up during the interglacial periods and goes down during the ice ages and so forth. And then on the bottom of this, well below it, they'll show what the temperature does and the temperature seems to follow. There is a very high degree of correlation between mm-hmm. carbon dioxide and temperature. Yeah. But And it's true, there's probably a very high degree of correlation, but a correlation does not make a cause and effect. You cannot use correlation as a cause and effect. Uh, I can say with a high degree of accuracy that there is a 100% correlation that every person that's breathing air today is going to eventually die. It doesn't mean that breathing air causes your death, it just means that there is a high correlation. Sure, yeah. Uh, and and that makes sense. In fact, if you don't breathe, you're going to die a lot sooner. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The fact exactly. Is, yeah, the fact is though that they're trying to make this correlation say that CO2 is causing the temperature when CO2 goes up, carbon or temperature goes up, and when CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. The problem is when you superimpose these graphs, and this is why they do not superimpose them. If you superimpose these graphs, you'll find that almost every time the temperature will go up before the carbon dioxide goes up, or the temperature will go down before the carbon dioxide goes down. Mm -hmm. And there's around an 800-year lag between the two. (laughs) Now, is there a physical cause of this, where a physical cause can cause both of these things to happen? Yes. When it gets warmer, when the Earth begins to warm, the oceans begin to warm. It takes a while for that to happen. But as Earth's oceans warm, there's about 10 times, no, there's 40 times more Uh, carbon dioxide in oceans than there is in the air. Hmm. In the oceans, carbon dioxide becomes less soluble when it's warmer. So as the oceans warm up, they release a lot of this carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere go up. Sure. When the oceans begin to cool, then carbon dioxide is reabsorbed back into the oceans. Hmm. And that's the reason there's a high correlation. Interesting. So you're saying 800 years lag? That, that's pretty long time, though. It is, and that's the reason why is that the oceans, the volume of the oceans and the specific heat of the oceans versus the air are so radically different. And there's been a number of studies. I'm not an oceanographer, so I can't say with accuracy exactly what happens. But at the same time, it takes a a lot more heat to warm up oceans than it does the air. And there's a lag period of several hundred years generally. Okay, so we can say then with with a you know certain degree, I guess, of certainty that temperature potentially then drives the CO2 level. So the question, of course, then becomes what drives the temperature? Which is a fascinating uh, possibility. You know, I'd be willing, and most scientists that are skeptical about man-caused global warming will say that man is probably causing some global warming. Uh, We're not saying that there is no effect that man is causing. Man is probably causing some. The matter, the 
the question is how much. Mm. But recent research by Sevensmark out of Denmark has, I think, opened up a whole other avenue of research mm. that will possibly explain exactly what happens. In fact, there's a very good uh, evidence that this will be the, the answer as to why we're having global warming or global cooling at different times. There's a phenomenon known as cosmic radiation. You've heard this uh, talked about it's in sci-fi films and all the rest and so forth. But there is cosmic radiation. The cosmic radiation is caused by exploding supernovae of sun uh, thousands of light years away. And when that cosmic radiation reaches the Earth, the cosmic rays enter the atmosphere and cause an increase level of cloudiness at the lower elevations. These are the low-level clouds. Mm -hmm. Well, low-level clouds do an interesting thing. They have an ability to reflect. If you've ever been in an airplane and you look down on a sunny day on the top of clouds, the clouds are very white, they're very brilliant. And right. The reason why is because the clouds are reflecting a lot of the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, if the energy is not being absorbed by the Earth, then the Earth gets cooler. And so cosmic radiation generally is followed, increased cosmic radiation is generally followed by more clouds and a cooler Earth. Now, when the sun becomes more active, and I'm not talking about just the amount of solar output itself directly, sure. even though that does have an effect, mm. but what I'm saying is that where there's more solar uh, winds, the solar winds are made up of these highly charged uh, nuclei and so forth, they have a tendency to push back the cosmic radiation right out of the, so the solar heliosphere, right mm -hmm. out of our, our planetary system. Mm. And when that happens, less cosmic radiation reaches the Earth's surface. There is less low cloud formation. And as a consequence, more solar radiation actually reaches the Earth's surface, and the Earth begins to warm. Mm. And the, the mathematics of it suggests that it could explain all of the warming that we've seen so far. There is a 100%, almost, well, I shouldn't say that, 96% correlation between cosmic radiation and low cloud formation. And what we've seen is less low clouds over the last 100 years, an increasing amount. And this is probably causing the actual warming that we're experiencing. Hmm. Now, more work has to be done by other scientific teams to, to demonstrate that they come up with the same results. Uh, but at the same time, it looks like that is exactly what causes the Earth to warm and cool, is the amount of solar radiation in the, the solar activity causing the solar winds that then affect the cosmic radiation and the cloud balance on planet Earth. Hmm. Very interesting. And that is, to one level, at least to me, kind of counterintuitive, so to speak. It's what I would guess that, you know, the more the sun has its, you know, uh, coronal mass ejections, we have the solar flares and the activity in general, that, that would yeah. kind of increase the temperature uh, on the on the Earth in that level. Um, but what you're saying is that because of that, it's blocking out the cosmic rays that potentially then could, right. uh, or leading to the, 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 you know, the low atmosphere clouds that you're talking about, and, and uh, yeah. you're referring to the Danish research again. And what is interesting here also, also I guess, is that right now we're in a... Uh, a low point, so to speak, of the sun, and we're actually, it's, it's going to increase from here. Uh, we've just entered into cycle 24, I guess, and That's right. uh, it mm -hmm. could potentially peak at around uh, 2011 to 2013, something like that. So what that could mean is that we po possibly could see, uh, you know, changes again then in the temperature up to those years, right? That's right. Generally speaking, the last several years, we've had a very flat period in our temperatures, and there's been no statistical increase in our temperatures for, since 1998-2000. Well, that's when the last uh, solar event peaked, just as it will in about 2010-2011 again. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that we're entering a decline period now, and we'll go best start going back up. Now, a Russian team is saying that, you know, if, they, if, they, if the sun follows its typical course of action, probably after this next solar maximum that occurs in 2010 or so, we'll start to see a major cooling trend again, just like happened in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll see a dip in temperatures for 30 to 40 years before it starts to go back up again. Sheesh. What did you say? 30 or 40 years? Yeah, in 19, well, it was 1945 to 1975 or so mm -hmm. that the Earth actually cooled for a period of time, and that's when the headlines were saying we're entering the next ice age. Oh, okay, but so this, but this then doesn't necessarily follow the the uh, the, the what it, what do NASA call it the 11-year cycle where we're up and down right. period. 
Well, we need to recognize that there are cycles upon cycles upon cycles, sure. uh, depending on the, the planetary closeness to the sun, the solar orbit, and all the rest. And apparently there's the 11-year cycle, and then you have a 40-year cycle, then a 120-year cycle, a 1,500-year cycle, and so forth, depending upon all these interacting forces. Sure. And if the Russians are right, I'm not saying they're right, but if they're right, uh, then we could have either a flattening period where there's really no warming at all from about 2010 on, or we'll have a slight cooling like we did in the, ni- the 1940s through the 1970s. Hmm. Very interesting. And, uh, I mean, we have the many people have heard it, uh, I guess, that they are listening to this program, but it's, it's worth mentioning again because it's an interesting correlation uh, that uh, global warming, so to speak, or, or warming of, of the planets has been going on uh, throughout our solar system, isn't that right? Yes. That is fascinating that you mentioned that. I meant to bring that up a moment ago in the fact that the various planets and moons of our planets in the solar system are also warming up. And if there's a, if the other planets are warming up and Earth is warming up, again, it gives credence to the fact that man is probably not causing at least most of the warming. It's a natural phenomenon. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, then, of course, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the clouds and so forth. Uh, uh, and I think you threw, threw out a number in, in your film uh, regarding the water vapor that this is one of the main uh, greenhouse gases, and we don't again we don't kind of think of that in a way you know when we when we hear all the chatter about the greenhouse gases, everyone thinks of CO2 immediately, but uh, water vapor is even a, l- a larger extent uh, a greenhouse gas than CO2. More, it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. In fact. Uh, if you actually look at the actual potential of a, as a greenhouse gas, the different greenhouse gases have actually different potentials. In other words, methane is 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even though there is much less methane and so forth, it has a much bigger footprint because of the fact that it has a more potent influence on greenhouse gases. But the most potent greenhouse gas is water vapor. And water vapor is one of the things that has been totally ignored. You'll never hear about that in the popular press. Hmm. And yet water vapor potentially accounts for up to 76% of all the greenhouse gas impacts. Hmm. And, and water vapor is going to be there one way or the other. Yes, it, it, on clear, dry days, there's not as much water vapor as there is on a rainy day or, or a foggy day or something of that nature. Hmm. But overall, over the whole entire planet, you're going to have about the same amount of water vapor, about 76% of the so-called greenhouse gases, are going to be accounted for by water vapor. And and that best, at the maximum, carbon dioxide is 27%. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> most of our greenhouse gases is water vapor. We don't have any control over that. Uh, carbon dioxide is 27%, and only 3% of that 27% is actually man-caused. And as a consequence, now you're down to about a half a percent that man is influencing the greenhouse gas composition of planet Earth. Hmm. And with water vapor, of course, I guess we could even tie in the rain in that, right? Yes. In fact, you know, there's a lot of speculation on this, and I and I can't be more accurate than anyone else is. Uh, the though man-caused uh, proponents basically will say that drier places will become drier, wetter places will become wetter. Mm-hmm. I'm not convinced of that at all, at the, and there's a lot of scientists that aren't. In fact, there is much evidence to suggest as we become warmer, we're going to have more rainfall, and you can actually begin to see that because apparently the during the, the cooling period from 1940s to the 19, middle of the 1970s, almost in the 1980s, the Sahara Desert advanced south. Well, now that it's warming, the green zone is starting to advance north again, or the Sierra Desert is is shrinking again. So mm-hmm. there's all kinds of speculation as to exactly what's going to happen with increased global warming. But there is going to have an effect. Uh, there's no question that warming is going to have some effects. That yeah. some is going to be negative in some places. And rather than spend billions and trillions of dollars, U.S. dollars, in trying to bring down carbon dioxide levels and harming economies, it makes a lot more sense, if you can't really fight it, if it's a natural phenomenon anyway, to try to develop and use that money to adapt to this changing climate rather than try to fight the changing climate. Right, right. I see what you mean. Um, you know, I can just say from from what I've experienced this year, at least in Sweden, uh, I guess the, the, the consensus of Sweden is that it 